Good morning, Mountain Citadel. It's Sunday, October 18th, and we welcome you as we worship together. I'm hoping that uh, we're able to uh, join together in our drive-in service. Um, we are hoping for uh, one more drive-in service the end of October, so please be in prayer for that. The uh, communique has come out, and there are some members of our core um, who need that extra prayer, uh, some scans that are going on, and some upcoming surgeries, so please uh, remember them during this time. As well, the uh, family fall retreat has been ongoing this weekend. Um, it's coming to an end today, but uh, take a look at it if you're able to join us. And uh, we thank Courtney for all the work that she's put into this weekend uh, to be able to allow us to connect during these times. And I just pray uh, for you and the families that you represent. And if there are people hurting or we need to connect with, please let us know so we can do that and we welcome you as we worship together. Today, as we enter into worship, we're shifting from Ezra to Esther, and we're going to be looking at the God of hidden places. And so I invite you to join me as I share a call to worship. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I praise you forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who hides us under your wings and protects us from the things that would serve to do ill towards us. But we thank you too, Lord, that when we are hiding, we find that you are the God of the hidden places and that you are the God in whom we can trust. And that when we seek out those hidden places, we find you there and that you are ready to envelop us, to take us in, to protect us and to be a father to us. And so we pray, Lord, as we enter worship this morning, that we would indeed find you to be the God of those hidden places, that you would be the God for us who leads us and speaks to us and meets us where we are. We pray that you will bless those who can't be with us for whatever reason and who can't worship with us either in person or online. And we pray that you will just be with them right now. We think of those who have particular concerns and we uphold them in prayer at this moment. And we pray now, Lord, that as we continue in worship, that you would presence yourself with us, guide us and lead us and meet us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Esther, chapters 1 and 2. Join with me as I read. Selected verses. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, and in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet, lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in the matter of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he said? She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Mamukin replied, If it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed, throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Memucan proposed. Later, when King Xerxes, when his fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for a beautiful young virgin for the king. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up, and because she had neither father or mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. When the turn came for Esther to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence 
in the tenth month, the month of Tabith, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. And may God reveal his message to us through the reading of his word.
Okay, Eddie, family retreat weekend. What have we learned so far? Uh, I can carve a pumpkin. Yeah, you can carve a pumpkin, that's true. What else have we learned? Uh, the people in our church are really funny. You're right, the people at our church are really funny, that's true too. What else? Oh, 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 oh! What? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> what chapter in the Bible have we been using? You're right. Psalm 123 is what we've been using. And what have we learned so far? What was our very first point? Oh, that was a long time ago. That was all the way on Friday. Uh, we are known. God knows us. You're right. God knows us. He knows who we are. He knows um, why we are the way we are. He knows everything about us even more than we know about ourselves, right? What uh, what was point number two? <sighs> oh, oh, oh! Uh, we're never alone! You're right, we're never alone. That was point number two. We're never alone. Okay, because God is always with us. No matter where we go or what we do, God is always with us, right? What was point number three? Oh, no. Uh, it was just last night, Eddie. Last night we talked about this. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Fearfully and wonderfully made. You're right. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Or um, fearfully set apart, right? We are carefully set apart to be exactly who we're meant to be. God knows us. He created us. He's always with us, right? So, in the verses that Colonel Bev read earlier, she was talking about how Queen Vashti had to leave the palace and King Xerxes had to find a new queen, right? So, he eventually picked Queen Esther to be his new queen. Now, Queen Esther, she was a Jew, so she shouldn't have probably been in the palace. But, she knew who she was, God knew who she was, and God knew that she needed to be in the palace, right? God knew her, God was always with her, and God um, made her for a purpose. In the book of Esther, Mordecai, Esther's cousin that raised her, actually says, perhaps you were here for such a time as this. Such a time as this! Right now! Well, he meant like then, but... You know, Esther knew who she was, where she came from, um, that she was never alone, and she knew that God had a plan for her, and there was a reason that she was in the palace. So, what I want to remind you guys of this weekend is not, the things we learned this weekend, we don't want to just leave them in this weekend, right? We don't want to just, oh yeah, okay, like, no. We, we, want, we want to remember that we are known, we're never alone, and we're loved. Because so many more amazing things can happen in our lives, just like Esther, and we can do so many cool things for God when we remember those three things. We're known, we're never alone, and we are made for a purpose. We are carefully set apart to be exactly who God wants us to be, okay? All right. Eddie, do you have anything to say? Thanks for letting me be in your family, everybody. Okay. All right. Bye, guys. When everything is not as it should be, one of the questions people ask quite frequently is, where is God? And as we have shifted our focus from the book of Ezra to the book of Esther, one of the prominent questions that scholars even raise in relation to that book is, where is God? In fact, in its pages, I think we can see that there is a backdrop of opulence, drunkenness, abuse of power, and 
all of the things that represent the livelihood and culture of the pagan world in which the Jews found themselves in Persia and no mention of God. The book reveals a series of hidden figures against the backdrop of opulence and drunkenness. And these hidden figures in the book really are its heroes. One of the movies that I have enjoyed watching over the last number of months that has come out this last year is the movie Hidden Figures. It follows the lives of extraordinary women of color, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, and Katherine Johnson, all of whom had strategic and integral uh, contributions that they played through the Apollo space missions for NASA women who moved from a position of obscurity to prominence and made a very significant impact in our world. God is a God who often works in the background. A hidden figure at times in those hidden places. As we look at the first couple chapters of the book of Esther, let me suggest and let me introduce to you three of these hidden figures. The first and most obvious hidden figure is God himself. And as I've alluded to already, God is absent in the entire book of Esther. As you read its text, you will discover that there is no mention of God's intervention or activity or, or any kind of interaction with God in the entire book. Perhaps it could be seen as the elephant of the, in the room for the book of Esther. Esther provides a lens into the life and culture which the Israelites lived and worked well in exile. But I believe it also gives some background on how God was working even quietly and silently behind the scenes in this Persian dynasty at the highest of levels to work his plan for his people. In the text, I believe that King Xerxes really does personify the epitome of godlessness of pagan life and culture. In the text, it tells us that we have a party that has lasted seven days following a six-month period of basically showing off his wealth and his power to all the surrounding aristocracy wherever he could find them, simply for the people to be impressed. It's not too hard in our own society to know that those kind of people and those kind of situations exist even to this very day. The purpose of King Xerxes' opulence and his hospitality was really to seduce people to pay him full allegiance and support in his kingdom. You know, in so many ways, it feels like God is absent in our society, sometimes in those very halls of power and influence. The book of Esther reads something like a page out of, out of a book, perhaps, of the lifestyles of the rich and famous of the Persian Empire. Un, untethered sin, self-centeredness, overindulgence, drunkenness, debauchery, you know, when you look at it, it, it doesn't uh, seem so much different than some of the newsreels and uh, news stories we see even today. You know, when we were in the, in the UK, one of the most prominent stories that hit even to the very center core of the British monarchy was the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. What is happening even in our own society behind closed doors? in the highest levels of power. 
And sometimes we ask ourselves, why is God silent in these times, in these places? Why doesn't he cut in and intervene? Why don't we see another Nebuchadnezzar writing on the wall kind of experience and intervention in this particular court? Instead, God seems absolutely silent throughout the story and seems to be content to watch it completely play out. Today we wonder why God seems silent in the face of such blatant regard for his sovereignty and perhaps even the very fundamentals of human dignity as we looked at last week. Not to mention the violence, abuse, injustice that we see worldwide. Yet it is here by faith we need to hold on to the fact that even in the face of blatant human disregard for God and his purposes, his activity and interventions are still taking place in the background, although unnoticed by us many, many times. Often for us, it is only the gift of hindsight that allows us to see where and how God has been at work when we haven't seen it while it's going on. In the case of the story of Esther, this hindsight was the result of the favorable disposition of the Persian dynasty towards the people of Judah and Israel, which ultimately allowed them to return to their land. God may appear to be a hidden figure in our own circumstances, but by faith we can know that just because God is hidden from our sight, doesn't mean God is not there or is not taking notice or is not inactive. God may be a hidden figure in this text, but as the story unfolds, we will see very clearly how God was allowing the events to carry out so his will and purposes could be revealed. The second hidden figure in this text is Queen Vashti. And we certainly need to give her significant credit here. Here is a lady that exchanged dynasty for dignity. A woman who chooses to become invisible and one who was very visible in so many ways. A true hero in this story. Vashti dared to say no, even at the bidding of her husband, the king, simply to preserve her dignity, and probably more importantly, his. She was not prepared to parade herself in front of the king and his drunken peers in this massive drunken party that he was holding on. Many scholars suggest that she may really have been trying to protect his reputation at this time as his judgment was, was skewed because of his drunkenness. She knew that to protect herself would also, by extension, protect his reputation, perhaps in more sobering times. But this act of defiance would cost her her crown. You see, the Persian culture was, as the Jewish culture was, a monogamous culture. But the kings found a way around that by gathering themselves harems uh, and multiple servant women to uh, bid to his, his attention, as we see in the text. But the queen normally was not part of any of that. Her duty and her responsibility was to maintain that image of dignity and, and poise and properness, if you will, towards the other people, if that's a word. Her duty to her husband and his reputation was pres to preserve hers in order to preserve his. To compromise his position, especially in the light of what was going on in that day, could have caused her serious 
problems and actually been considered as treason. She was faced with a dilemma and she chose the high road. You know, after this first chapter, we see no further mention of Vashti in the entire book. She lived the remainder of her life in relative obscurity. Vashti is a tremendous example to us of someone who's willing to stand by their integrity even when it means passing up for promotions or even that dream job. Sometimes, even in our society today, the pressure is on for us to compromise for the sake of the company loyalty or the desires of an employer for one to turn the other way or to turn a blind eye, if you will, and still maintain their integrity. Regrettably, people can sometimes be sidelined or passed up for promotion, not because of their lack of skill or credential, but simply because of their integrity, their stand. Let me encourage you today by reminding you that any promotion or job or opportunity that comes where you're faced with a discussion or a decision to compromise your beliefs and integrity probably is not for you as a child of God, regardless of how well this might place you in society or set you up financially for life. As the testimony of Vashti affirms, it is better to live in relative obscurity on earth than to jeopardize our integrity for eternity. Vashti is a hero and hidden figure. The third hidden figure in the text is Esther herself. In fact, her name can be interpreted, the Hebrew root of her name, S-T-R, means to hide or conceal. One of the key elements of the story is Exus, Exers had no idea who Esther was. Right through to the time that she was made king. King Xerxes had no idea that Esther was Jewish. In fact, verse 10, as, as my wife has read, uh, indicated that Mordecai made sure that Esther did not reveal her identity. She was truly a hidden figure. And perhaps we see this situation almost in direct contrast to that of uh, Vashti because Esther, or at least Mordecai, was willing somehow to compromise Esther's uh, position under Jewish law not to intermarry, to be included in the group of, of young women who were going to be considered to be married with a pagan king. And again, here we find a situation very odd that God seems to be silent here. God doesn't have any credit in, in Mordecai's decision making. In fact, probably God knew full well that this was something that Mordecai was dreaming up on his own. And yet he allows it to happen. And perhaps because he knew that by allowing this chain of events to unfold, Esther would find herself in the position of queen. I think the bigger key to this story is that Esther herself remained true to her God and her people, even in her marriage. And we will see at the end of the book um, that that resulted in that favorable disposition of that entire Persian dynasty towards the people of Israel, which allowed them to return to the promised land. The text also reveals that it was Esther's character and natural beauty that won over Exus against all the women of the kingdom who had lined up to vie for his affection. In many ways, it looks like a, an ancient Cinderella kind of story, doesn't it? The servant girl who would become queen. Although her identity as, as a Jew was hidden from the king, her countenance 
needed not to be hidden or masked behind any kind of facade or makeup and adornment. In fact, the, the text reminds us in verse 15 that Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. When she went to be presented to the king, she was not made up at the same level as the others. And yet the king found her more attractive than any of the other women and crowned her as king. You know, sometimes I feel even today that people need to seem to feel they need to create some kind of elaborate facade for themselves to gain acceptance and hide the real self behind that facade. Many have been fooled by such a facade, and only after the fact they see the real person behind it, behind the mask. In some way, Esther was really able to win the king over without the superficial mask of adornment and become for him a very trusted and intimate confidant. This is a good reminder to us to resist temptation to hide behind our masks and allow ourselves to be vulnerable, allowing people to see our potential and be used of God to the fullness of that potential. In the same way, the hidden heroines of the movie Hidden Figures were, so can we be willing to stand up and come out of the shadows to allow God to work his will and purposes in our lives. Friends, even as a text will present itself in such a way that we we tend to see the absence of God, don't let the seeming non-presence or absence of God, even in our own situations, allow us to get sidetracked. Just because we can't see something doesn't mean It's not there. As I conclude, let me remind you that God is continually active in the hidden places of our lives to effectuate his will and purpose for his children. And even when we cannot see directly how God is allowing these situations, even COVID-19, He knows the way. He knows the end of the story. Our entire response is to trust him and his purposes for our life, even when we cannot see the way forward. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that even in those times where you are hidden from us. We know by faith you are there. Working your will and your purposes for us behind the scenes, in places we don't expect. Father, help us, your people, to remain faithful to you, even when you seem silent. May our obedience faith be that which we rely on to to bring us confidently through this journey of life because we know that you are there ready and willing to receive your children unto your own. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you for joining with us during this service uh, once again online, and we look forward to continuing this series next week. In the meantime, know of our continued prayerful support for you and your families, and if there is anything we can do to support you in these days, please feel free to contact us at any time. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, may he uplift you and support you in these days and the days to come. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.